Uh, March 11th was the seventh anniversary of the great Japanese uh, earthquake and tsunami. Now, in that event, five million tons of debris washed into the Pacific Ocean. And that debris began arriving on the shores of North America and Hawaii a year later. Now, on that debris were hundreds of species of uh, marine organisms, many of which we had never seen on this side of the Pacific. And also, uh, this was the first time that this kind of large-scale transport of organisms uh, on, on debris uh, were directly observed. So in 2012, when the debris started coming in, I joined a collaborative effort to study marine life on, on the debris. Now, one of the explanations for global distributions of species is transoceanic rafting, right? Now, however, as I've said, this was the first time that we were able to observe this movement and to observe this movement, movement on, on a big scale. Now, also for the first time, living species were recorded landing on the shores of North America carried by debris from Japan, right? So this, this, this challenges assumptions about uh, ocean ecosystems that, the, that organisms couldn't possibly survive a trip this long uh, and hazardous. So the big question then becomes, what is the potential for colonization of these organisms um, in North America and Hawaii? Now, so this morning I will explore the role of the tsunami debris in species dispersal. How did debris travel and what did it bring? And what are the implications for invasions biology? Now, uh, before I proceed, let's just consider, consider that the fundamental, fundamental to the understanding of patterns of biogeography and ecology is taxonomic research in museums, right? So hold on to this thought, and I will get back to it at the end of my talk. Now, compared to the terrestrial environment, uh, marine systems appear to present fewer physical, uh, 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 fewer physical barriers to uh, biological exchange, right? Uh, and, and additionally, the transport of species by natural debris, uh, sorry, uh, excuse me, uh, by natural floating uh, materials such as uh, logs or uh, clumps of vegetation or pumice, uh, that has been occurring for millions of years. But nevertheless, now, bioge biogeographic boundaries exist in oceans. Now, you've heard about biogeographic boundaries on land in terms of plants and insects. Now, in, in the ocean, for example, uh, changes in ocean circulation are often associated with very abrupt changes in temperature. So warmer water species, such as Western Pacific species, for, uh, for example, would be unlikely to survive in the coastal regions, uh, sorry, in colder regions, even if they could transgress these boundaries, right? And, and also natural rafts, because of the material that they're, they're uh, composed of, are quicker to degrade or sink. But what if, what if ocean temperatures rise? What if organisms had bigger, more permanent rafts that don't sink as easily? And what if the material for these rafts are concentrated in large quantities along coastlines? Well, climate change has resulted in higher ocean temperatures. Right? That's one. Two we are creating immense amount of plastics and other materials along the shore. It's ready to be washed out to the ocean, right? These are great, uh, very effective transoceanic dispersal vectors ready to go. So the stage is set for a new era of invasions of the world's oceans, right? And the 2011 tsunami, very tragically, 
demonstrated exactly how this would happen. Now, in, in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see the model of the tsunami debris movement. The movement of the debris continued to occur for many years after the event. So this is not a, not a straight line A to B transport, okay? And the debris landed in different locations at different times. So we have multiple trajectories over multiple years. Now, early on, uh, er, early on, objects that sit high, high, high in the water, such as docks and boats and buoys, uh, including that big dock you saw in the previous slide, uh, those arrived first, okay? Mostly wind-driven objects. Now, later on, objects that are sitting lower in the water, current-driven objects, such as uh, wooden house beams, uh, those started to come. So you have different, the composition of materials changed uh, over time, uh, as well as their intensity and uh, and, and, and when they're arriving. So the other thing that we learned from this, uh, looking at this material, was that diversity, diversity of, of organisms declined over time, so probably due to the rough environment of the open ocean. And most of these, uh, and if you, look at the, if you look at the graph on the bottom right-hand corner, uh, you notice one thing, now, though that's a graph of uh, organisms that we know that were already here uh, in proportion to organisms that came on the tsunami material. Now you'll see that uh, in, in terms of the, the larger animals like fish and sea stars, uh, those are more easily detected and could, could, uh, could account for what you're looking at the graph. Now animals such as the uh, cnidarians that I study a little more difficult to detect. You can see that uh, there's a greater proportion that's already here versus what is coming over. So it, it's uh, different species. The largest species are often the first ones that we see naturally, All right? So will, it, will, will new invasions occur or have they already occurred? Well, the answer is yes, perhaps, perhaps. Uh, populations of non-native species may take years to grow to the point of detection. So how many of them will, will we be able to detect? Uh, so our work now is focused on answering that question, right? And, and, and sharing the data that enables us to answer this question. Which brings me to uh, a very important point. Now, The, in, in terms of sharing the data, um, the, what, one of the ways that we share data is to have, uh, to, to be able to go back to look at the collections and see what they're telling us. Now, my first point about the importance of systematic research in museums and taxonomy in museums. Take a look at those numbers. In this project, we had, we had eight, 80 taxonomists from 13 countries, right? That's 80 taxonomists from 13 countries. Now then look at the distribution of these people in North America, five. Uh, there's one in the Smithsonian, one in the Bishop Museum in Hawaii, two at the California Academy of Sciences, and one at the Royal BC Museum. So when we talk about, and that, that so it's five, five out of 80. So when we speak about the importance of taxonomic research and why we're doing it. Well, the underlying basis to be able to understand uh, species distributions and to be, understand, to be able to properly account for what's happening in the ecology is, first of all, you must know what they are. And that is what we do in museums. So when I look, at, when I look around a room and I'm hearing my colleagues talk about the work they do in taxonomy, um, that, that's very encouraging. Thank you.